food. You're what? You have food. You're here for the food? Oh, they're cute. Oh. Should we pet the goats? <laughs> you dressed and ready for entrepreneurship class, right? <laughs> Hi, and welcome back to Once Upon a Tiny Farm. My name's Drew. In today's video, I'm going to give you a little vlog here with our first experience at going to Homesteaders of America conference in Virginia. This conference I've never been to before. I've always wanted to go and we finally went as a family. We had a really good time and I think the best way to describe Homesteaders of America, uh, I guess it's kind of like Comic-Con for Homesteaders. Uh, basically the Homesteaders of America event is filled with people who are very aware of the current state of affairs in the world, but these are people that don't live in fear and are all looking to do something about it. What can I do about it? Those are my kind of people, and it was really cool to be in an atmosphere surrounded by those kind of like-minded people. So I'm gonna narrate this as I go through um, everything that we did at Homestars of America and give you a taste of what it was like there. Um, so let's get into it. The very first thing we did uh, when we got there, uh, we signed up our daughter Lucy for entrepreneurship for kids class and that was at 8.30 and so we rushed in and she got to that right before it started and I think she really enjoyed that that class. I really wanted her to take that class. Um, a couple times I think she, it was it was a little long for her um, but they were going over ways that kids could uh, find ways to make money around our homesteads and stuff. So that was a cool thing for her. We do have to intake water. So how many of you guys have a well or city water? And I got some footage, a little bit of footage of her in there. But um, while her class was going on, uh, my wife and I and Matthew were walking around uh, the fairgrounds. And in the back corner by the big, there was a big red barn where they had a lot of speeches and talks. But outside the barn, was a lot of the bigger homestead type uh, YouTubers like Justin Rhodes was back there, Jill Winger was back there, um, Zach and Jen uh, Stiver of Stiver's Homestead were back there, said hello to them. Um, that first day, there were so many people in line to see Justin Rhodes and to get uh, see Jill Winger and get her book signed. I got so nervous uh, just being back there. Uh, I just. I don't know, all my anxiety and stuff uh, build up. I, I didn't build up the nerve to talk to Justin until the second day, but that first day I just saw where everything was and it was pretty cool to be in the vicinity of all those people that I looked up to for so long. And uh, yeah, so the first um, event um, or speech that we, we talked to was by Matt Boudreaux, who I follow on uh, Instagram. He's an awesome account, uh, talks a lot about homeschooling and he had a really good talk on that and I got some footage of him uh, from his speech and uh, yeah it was some good inspiration for for us to keep moving forward uh, with our homeschooling path. But equating sta standards to what the government says you should be doing when you should do it, here's the grade level, here's what they need to know at this age, here's what, again it's a concept man but we just need to uh, like what's the deal, what's the disconnect, and so we're having this kind of conversation right? So I'm speaking about what we're doing on our campuses. I'm speaking about the difference and how we're uh, attack, you know, attacking education and how I'm bringing that home as well and doing things differently with, with, my own, with my own kids. The Yale MBA guy finally got so fed up that he's like, he's like, I have to disagree with everything Matt's saying. He's like, first of all, your businesses, like, th those are not sustainable. How many of you guys didn't get great grades in school? Oh, how was prison, sir? <laughs> like, clearly is that we take this concept of grades and grade level to then slap on the kids and go, okay, well, here's what you should be able to do when you should be able to do it. That's the biggest problem with this whole thing. The, uh, the next speaker that we saw um, was Ann Aceta Scott, and she talked about different ways that you could make uh, money on a smaller uh, plot of land, on a smaller homestead. And they talked about a lot of different things like workshops, and um, creating kind of ebooks or just different ways, things that people could print out, uh, printable digital products. Um, 
that could benefit other people. And I, I took a lot of notes at these classes. Her speech, her talk was very good, and I took some footage of her as well. Okay. Additional, what they can do on that, they can have a private hands-on workshop with just me and them, there, which actually is nicer because they don't feel pressured to not look bad in front of somebody else, and they don't know what they're doing. And then we walk through it. We do it. We can only walk through it. And then they can do a farm so This is going to give you general ideas of the potential that you can have to watch in your home. Guess what? You want to know where I keep my workshop? In my bathroom? In my house? In my house because my farm store is not built yet because we don't have a tractor yet, so I don't fill the farm school until my tractor is purchased, right? So we do this in my house. I have 15 and sold and flow waiting list for the next round because I probably won't be out there. After we saw her talk, uh, later in the day there was a talk by uh, Mike Dixon from The Fit Farmer, and I really like his channel because I felt, uh, just from watching his videos, that like I liked his personality, he seems fun, down to earth, his family down to earth, humble, they live in a yurt. You know, we live in a tiny house. They have a market garden. We have a market garden. I just had a feeling like we had a lot in common. I really like the way that he makes his videos on his channel. And um, so we saw his talk was about family, how, how you work, get things done with family on the homestead. And I took a lot of good things away from his talk as well. Farm, your home, everyone, is the most important part. And if we lose that focus, and when we lose that focus, and we're focusing on other things, we may be succeeding. We may have the best chicken system that there is, or the best pig system that there is. But if our families are crumbling, eventually everything will crumble and fall apart. The best part about um, seeing uh, Mike Dixon was being able to meet with him after his speech. Um, I was hoping my whole family could get a picture with him, but my kids were done. It was, it was like 2 o'clock at the time, and my kids had been there since 8 o'clock in the morning. We're ready to go back to our Airbnb. Um, but I, got, I waited in line to just chat with him because I just felt like I would connect with him, and, and I did. I got to talk to him. Um, I wasn't nervous like I thought I would be. Um, he was really cool, and I told him about that we live in a tiny house and that we have a market garden and all these things we have in common. And he just came out of the blue and said, you know what, maybe we could collaborate on a video in the future. And I thought, yeah, that would be amazing if we could collaborate on, on a video. Um, and he told me to send him an email because he was uh, talking about maybe doing a video on Amos Miller, the um, Amish farmer in the Lancaster area. And he was asking me how far away I was from, from him and then maybe we could collaborate while he's down here in this area and we could shoot another video or something. That would be amazing. So I'm definitely gonna send him an email. And if this trip ends up with me doing some uh, collaborative video with uh, Mike Dixon, I would be, uh, that would make the trip totally worth it. Although it was worth it, even if that doesn't happen because we had a really good time and got to meet a lot of cool people. All right, so the next thing we did, um, the next day we went back and the first uh, speech we saw was by Jill Winger. Um, and she, uh, her speech was called Old Fashioned Parenting. Really enjoyed her talk as well. She had a good point. Um, it wasn't her, um, it was, she was talking about a book, I think it was called Digital Minimalism. And there was a topic um, or at least a term that in that book called um, solitude deprivation and I thought that was a really interesting term and I can totally relate to that because what that term means is that you work so much and you were constantly kept busy by this barrage of our phones and social media and our busy schedules and all these things that distract us from being able to sit still and quiet with our own thoughts and that when you're distracted from that, from having just a little bit of quiet time to yourself, how that could be almost as bad as, as smoking or worse. Um, and I think that's true because I used to work really hard. I used to work long hours and I never had time to myself. I never had time to take care of my body. And it definitely was beneficial to me when I quit my job and I had more time to be at home with my kids and actually have conversations and energy with them. 
So that that one hit home, and that's one that I definitely uh, took a mental note. I might need to read that book. Right? I, I, mean, I love podcasts. I love music. I love audiobooks. Um, I'm always filling my mind up. I, I love to learn, but I also have to remember to keep myself those little gaps where I can just be alone with my own thoughts. And I think that's a- accidentally that we do we do accidentally as parents is that we micromanage. Does anyone else tend to do that as a parent? It's okay. I do it too. After I got that, um, after we watched her speech in the morning, um, the next thing we did was watch Justin Rhodes had a. Uh, talk about when things go wrong on the homestead. I got um, some footage of him talking in that speech. I was all the way in the back of the room because obviously it was super crowded. We got there a little later than I would have uh, liked to, but uh, it was cool to be able to see him speak in person. He's very, um, he's very cool. Like he's very entertaining um, as he is on his channel and he has a really good way about him to keep people interested in what he's saying. Um, so it's never a, like a dull moment. He had a lot of good stories. So it was really cool to actually see him in person. Okay. And you might write it out six ways I can do this. How can I? One of them might be rob a bank. Let your mind flow. You probably don't need to go robbing a bank. But another one might be, oh, go jump in the dumpsters and look for scrap food. And, and you know, go to the co-ops, go to the, the earth fairs, the Whole Foods, and go to those dumpsters. That's organic. We'll feed that to the chickens. You might think, well, it's no harder to raise 12, 24 chickens instead of 12, and I could sell some of the eggs from those extras, some of the meat from those extras, and that will help pay for the food. Okay? Or, instead of just moving the chickens once a week, I'll start moving them once every day, and I'll start rationing their food and bringing back their food. That's actually a true story. This is Rebecca and I transitioning from GMO feed to organic feed, and our food, our overall food bill after implementing all of those things was much less than it was even before feeding the GMO. After that, we went to the big barn. There was a speech by Jill Reagan. Um, she wrote a book recently called The Tiny But Mighty Farm. Um, and she has a little bit more in common with me where she's on a smaller plot of land, not as small as ours. She's got a larger plot, but she talked about a lot of different ways that you can maximize a small uh, plot of land and I took some notes on her um, from her speech on different ways that she fertilizes her plants um, and things like that that um, I think that I would benefit from next year so her speech was very good and I like her uh, YouTube channel as well uh, Whispering Willow Farm. If succession sowing seems daunting to you play around with this because I think you'll be so surprised at how easy it makes it. I love it because when I'm out of town, I can create a task list, print it off, leave it with Nathan and the team and be like, hey, these are the things I need started while I'm gone. I need this bed prepped. We have it all our bed labeled. Everything is color coordinated and it just makes it really simple. Uh, later in the day, we were just walking around, seeing all the different vendors that were there. There were some cool different kinds of vendors. Um, Redmond Real Salt was there, and um, as they were packing up their tent, I purchased one of their uh, soil tests. Um, I've seen some videos where people, I think Jill Ringer did it in one of her videos. She used uh, Redmond's uh, soil test, and I thought that was cool how you take it and then send it to them, and then you register it online, and in a few days you'll be able to see your results online of everything that's in the soil, and I thought that was cool. So I got one. And they actually gave me a free one as they were packing up. So I got two for the price of one. So I, I could do a soil test this year and then I have one I could save for next year and compare. So that was really nice. Um, I got a cool uh, Homesteaders of America shirt that I'm actually wearing under my shirt. I wanted to get some more things uh, like merch and stuff there, but your money just flies by at places like that. So yeah, you had to, I had to uh, be careful because I wanted to spend all my money. Towards the end of the day, there was a group uh, Q&A where all the speakers from the event were up on stage and people were just going up asking them different questions and um, I got a lot of footage of that from uh, back in the audience of the barn um, so I'm gonna I'll give you some of that footage now I have to dig in my freezer to get to my beef or something besides so do I just erode it and have 10 freezers or do we go the next scale like Jill and Christian have done? And 16 by 16 walk-in freezer. It almost killed us getting it built, so maybe.
I heard that story and I'm a little nervous. Don't use the freezer guy in Denver and he'll be fine. Go big or go home. I like your husband. <laughs> I do sell parted birds when it's illegal to sell parted birds. You've got to know where you're at and what you're comfortable with. You don't sound comfortable. And I, I love you, I don't know you, but you don't sound well, comfortable. No, no. Then don't do it. Yeah. I then mean, don't do it. Yeah. That's what it boils down to. All right. I love you though. Thank you. Thank you. Bring them into this crowd. So even if they happen, even if you put the crowd, like say, in a central spot, but you're still as small as you are, it could be that rather than either raising the price or expanding, um, it may be the, the best thing you could do is um, is think about some, selling egg salad. You know, and create that dozen eggs and suddenly, you know, a, a triple the price. After um, that group Q&A, we were walking around. Uh, I actually got separated from my wife and kids. Um, there was a place, there was like a train set that kids were playing on. And Stephanie was with them. And I was just walking around and walked past Justin Rhodes tent and realized that there was nobody there and like it was my opportunity to go up to Justin Rhodes and Rebecca and introduce myself but I didn't want to go up by myself so I was waiting I called Stephanie I was like hey come over here we have a, our chance to meet Justin Rhodes and um, she came over and we got to talk to them and that was like the highlight of the day like that was so cool to be able to talk to Justin and Rebecca um, I was so nervous to talk to them at first like like I mentioned the first day, I, I was too nervous to go over there. Plus, I couldn't even get over there because there was such a long line of people that wanted to talk to them. And when I got up to them, uh, to Justin, I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Drew. Um, it's nice to meet you. Um, and I told him, I blabbered a little bit about our farm. I told him how much he was an inspiration to me to try to get my family home and bring us all home and do everything from home like he does. And then he asked me um, if we had accomplished that yet. And I told him, no, like we're not all the way there, but we're getting closer. And I told him how I just monetized my YouTube channel this year and that I have a market garden and I'm selling at uh, produce at a farmer's market and stuff like that. And then after there, I remember my brain kind of like froze and like I, I got out everything that I wanted to say and there was more things that I wanted to say that I just like was so caught up in the moment and... Uh, I just couldn't get out, and then I got distracted. My kids were in there with me, and like Rebecca um, wanted to see. Matthew was holding a book about uh, different trucks that they bought from one of the uh, vendors that was selling books, uh, kids' books. And Rebecca asked uh, little Matthew if she could take a look at it, maybe for Henry, their youngest. And Matthew's like, no, no, no. And he was all like, it's mine. And she's like, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm just... It's okay, it's okay, I won't take your book. But um, no, that was really cool to be able to meet them. And we took a group picture and they were just so nice, um, down to earth people. And uh, yeah, that that was just awesome. And there was more I wanted to say um, to him uh, in particular that I didn't get to. Like the one big thing, I don't know how that slipped my mind because he probably would have found it really interesting and maybe memorable. Is I could I wanted to tell him that we live in a tiny house, you know, very frugal, and like we worked really hard to pay off our debt, and like we own everything more without a mortgage. Um, I don't know how that slipped my mind. It's hard to, in just a moment, like tell your life story to someone, and like I don't want to be the type of person to just talk too much uh, to a person because I want to be respect their time, and I felt kind of bad too because they had just gotten off the stage from that Q&A and they were quickly eating um, their dinner that they brought with them. So they were talking while they were eating and I felt a little weird about that, but he said it was okay. He could like talk and eat at the same time. But I could tell like he was like, had this like tired look on his face. And I, it's another thing I would have asked him if I had more time, like, do you get exhausted by these kind of events to constantly have these interactions with people that are, you know, that watch you because like, I'm obviously, like, not famous like, like he is, very, very famous and recognizable. Like, I, from my anxiety, like, I would be exhausted at the end of the day from so many of those interactions, talking to people. Like, some people, it lifts them up to have all those conversations, but me, it would just drain the life out of me to have to have so many of those conversations. That's just how I am. I'm more of an introvert, um, 
And some introverts can do that kind of thing um, somehow, but it's hard for me to power through that um, unless it's something that I'm really, really like passionate about. Um, but it's still hard to have so many of those conversations, uh, you know, personal conversations with people one after the other. I would be totally exhausted. But I guess he's used to it because he's used to being in front of the camera and entertaining a lot of people. But um, it comes very natural to him and Rebecca. Um, I wish I had that skill. Maybe I'll have to build that up because I found myself walking around the fairgrounds and I had my camera in my hand and it's like I wanted to film a lot of things but I also wanted to enjoy the experience because it was my first time there and it's hard to balance that kind of thing for one it's also hard because like I'm an introvert and I don't want to like do all those interactions like I just wanted to enjoy myself so I didn't film as much as I wanted to, I filmed some of the speeches and stuff, just little snippets, but I was trying to watch and learn um, and enjoy the moment. And I did that. And I um, messaged um, Rebecca on one of their Instagram posts. They said that this they've been there for the last six straight years at Homesteaders of America, but after this year, they're probably gonna take a break from going to that event because it's a, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. It's only two days, but it's, it's just a lot of stuff. And I think she wrote that they're going to focus on their house and their family, and I respect that. But it just makes me more grateful that I was able to meet with them because I might not have a chance to do that at Homesteaders of America in the future if they don't go um, anymore, if they take a break for a few years. But um, that, was, that was amazing, and uh, yeah, they were awesome. Another thing I would have told him is how much I appreciate um, and, and have tried to learn from him uh, from a business perspective because I don't come from... I don't have a lot of people around me that are building businesses that I can like learn from, but I just watched him over the years, how he's found ways to monetize like his life and everything that he's doing anyway. And I learned a lot from him business wise by just seeing the things that he's doing and like writing books and doing courses and, you know, making the videos, um, there's a lot of things that I never thought of that he's doing and that's, I'm just watching him. He's kind of like a mentor, even though I never met him. Um, I would have wished I had more time to tell him that or that my brain could function so I could tell him all these things I wanted to say. Uh, I just really appreciated him, and I've always looked up to the things he's done for the homesteading community. Um, he's kind of the big first you know, channel that went mainstream, and a lot of people have follow are following in his footsteps. And then after that, I actually had the courage to go up to Jill Winger's tent and I bought her book. She signed it for me. Um, she was really cool. I wish I could have talked to her more. Um, I felt like a lot of pressure to just keep things short because there was a long line and I don't want to talk on and on about myself, but I guess it was a time where maybe I could have told her more about us. But I, after I rushed off after getting the book and getting the signature, it's like, oh my god, everybody's taking pictures with her. I should have asked her to, to grab a picture with her. Um, but um, I, I put in my, on my Instagram stories a picture of the book and how she signed it. And then she messaged me on Instagram um, that it was nice to meet me. And I was like, so nice. And then I, I told her, man, I, I felt so silly after I walked away from your table because I wanted to get a picture with you. And she said, it's okay next time, you know, so... That was cool that I got to meet her and I uh, got her book and I'm very excited to read her book because I like her writing and basically everything she does, she's awesome. I also want to do a story time. So you guys excited about that? Are you excited? Yes! So if they catch you, you become a catcher. All right, so the game ends when everybody's caught. Are you ready? So you have to make it to the other side. On your mark. Get set. Don't do it. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, on your mark. Get set. Go. Oh, you made it. All right, if you got caught, you're a catcher. Catchers, go to this side. So yeah, that was a really cool part of the conference. That was like the last thing we did on the last day. So that was great. But the best part of it was just being around a lot of uh, like-minded people. Like everybody was so nice. 
Um, there were so many families there, there's so many kids there, so I didn't feel so bad that Matthew was like screaming at every single event where we were trying to sit and watch people talk, and he hated being in a stroller. I think next year, if we go back again, maybe he'll go to Grandmom's house, so uh, we'll just take Lucy with us because it was kind of hard for him to sit still at his age. Um, but it was so cool, like there, everybody was just so nice and down to earth and yeah, just good people, good energy, like the air was lighter, you know, it was just a really nice place to be. So if you've never been to Homesteaders of America conference, look into it for next year. I bought our tickets as soon as, I'm on uh, an email list with them, and as soon as they announced that they were for sale this year, they went for sale the first week of January of this year, and I bought them as soon, and they sold out uh, pretty quickly, so I'm glad I got tickets. I think there are about 6,000 people there from what I've heard, so it was an amazing event, very well run. Definitely check it out if you've never been to Homesteaders of America. Check it out for next year. Um, you won't regret it. But anyway, that's uh, gonna wrap up this video. I just wanted to share our experiences at Homesteaders of America. We just got home today and I wanted to share it while all these thoughts were still in my brain. Um, so yeah, if you found this video helpful in any way, uh, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel too if you're new here. I'd really appreciate that as well. All right, so thanks for watching and we'll catch you in the next one.